Good evening, and welcome to tonight's discussion in collaboration with BCU Massey Cancer Center and Genentech on social drivers of health. My name is Teresa Sims with Here for the Girls. At H4TG, we believe in empowering individuals through education. Helping to understand and addressing social drivers of health is a vital step to reducing health inequities. Multiple studies show that 30 to 55 percent of health outcomes are impacted by social drivers of health, or SDOH for short. SDOH are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, including a wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. Tonight, in collaboration with Genentech and VCU, H4TG is hosting a discussion to explore social drivers of health by asking questions to better understand how they impact your health. This information presented is for educational purposes only. For specific questions or concerns, please consult your health care provider. If you are, there will be a Q&A at the end of the discussion and we invite, and we really want to hear your questions. If you're joining us tonight on Facebook Live, please post your questions to the chat. I would like to thank Genentech and BCU Massey Cancer Center for making tonight's event possible. We are joined by Judy Simpson, a proven diversity, equity, and inclusion leader at the local, regional, and national level, passionate about population health issues and access to health care for all patients. She is an accomplished leader with over 20 years industry experience. Juni's efforts are focused on building and catalyzing a sustainable model to address healthcare disparities in marginalized communities, embedding early disease detection and education. Juni serves as an ambassador for Genentech with her external diversity recruitment efforts and is the current head of health equity for all customer facing teams tasked with the operationalization of Genentech's commercial health and equity strategy. Her work includes serving as the immediate past Southwest Region Corporate Relations President for Healthcare Business Women Association, Chair of African Americans in Biotechnology, which is a Genentech employee resource group, and the DNI Steering Committee, where she sits on the Advancing Inclusive Research Team. Welcome. Dr. Anithia Sutton is an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Services at Virginia Commonwealth University and a member of VCU Massey Cancer Center. Dr. Sutton received her PhD from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2017, and she completed a T32 postdoctorate fellowship in cancer prevention and control from VCU in 2022. She is the principal investigator of the CARES Lab which stands for Cancer Advocacy and Research for Equity and Survivorship. Currently, her lab is conducting studies to understand how psychosocial stress and coping impacts hypertension and breast cancer survivors and to investigate how social drivers of health impacts black survivors' attitudes and decisions about clinical trials. She also leads Facts and Faith Fridays, a partnership between BCU Massey Cancer Center and the African American faith-based community that provides accurate information and resources to improve the health of our communities. Thank you both for joining us this evening. And we would like to share to start by sharing a short video to help set the stage for tonight's discussion. Why didn't the doctor believe me? Did I say something wrong? Do we have to experience the same pain and bias as our parents and grandparents? What if they actually gave us access to those clinical studies we learned about and those cutting edge medicines? How many lives would that save? How much longer will we live? What if we ask the bigger questions? and really tackled the root causes of systemic inequities in healthcare. People of color still do not receive equal access to healthcare. We're determined to change this. 
Tonight, we are prepared to ask some of the bigger questions. So as our discussion focuses on social drivers of health, Judy, can you provide thoughts regarding what you feel to be some of the core social drivers of health? Absolutely. So um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Judy Simpson. I'm the head of health equity for customer engagement at Genentech. I have no disclosures to report as I'm here representing Genentech as a full-time employee. So I, I think I would just level set with just defining health equity. And so health equity simply means that everyone has the opportunity to achieve their best health regardless of age, race, sexual orientation, ability, where they live or work, or in this case, you know, in terms of um, the sex of a person. And socioeconomic barriers um, such as poverty and discrimination can lead to healthcare disparities. And so when you think about healthcare disparities, this is lack of housing, a safe environment where you live, education, as well as healthcare. And so when you think about closing the gaps and improving um, equitable access to care, um, this is why we're here today, to really raise awareness um, of the importance of screening and actually community activation so that we can all get to where we're closer to equity for all people as it relates to healthcare. So why now? Um, I, we anchor our strategy to an actual statistic that by 2045 we'll be a majority minority country. There are several states that are already there, California being one of them. Um, Texas being another, New Mexico, New York, Florida. And so the 2020 census actually has that ages zero to 18, we're already there as a majority of minority country. So once these babies grow up, we are there. And so unfortunately, less than 10% of the patients that are enrolled in clinical trials are of non-Caucasian um, ancestry. And so also when you look at the promise of personalized healthcare, 88% of the genomic materials are from um, Caucasian or European ancestry. So we can definitely do a better job including communities of color into our clinical trials so that the data is reflective of the patients that have the disease. So I always like to talk about the cost of doing nothing. And this is data that has been adjusted for inflation from 2008, and this adjustment was done in 2016. So this is ahead of the pandemic. And um, really since the pandemic, this actual number is in the trillions. But it shows that the direct medical cost is $229.4 billion. But when you think about the indirect cost, lost productivity due to illness and early death, it is nearly a trillion. And so our society cannot afford to continue to sustain the cost of doing nothing about healthcare disparities. And so this is why we're here and, and, and really want to be a part of solving for it. So in 2020, Genentech launched a health equity study to uncover patient perceptions and the experiences with the US healthcare system. And so this study was relaunched in 2021 to examine year over year change with patients' experiences and their perceptions. And so we know that a history of mistreatment has led to a lack of trust in underserved, historically marginalized communities. And what we found was after surveying 2,207 people, half of which were from the general population and the other 1,207 were from the, what we call the medically disenfranchised belonging to LGBTQ+, Black, Latinx, as well as low socioeconomic status. And what they found was Half of the general population felt like their experience with the medical, um, you know, the healthcare is, was fine. There was not, nothing to see there. But what we found was 52% of the medically disenfranchised felt like the system was rigged against them. And these were the patients not opting into clinical research or being um, vaccinated due to lack of trust. And then unfortunately, a 2021 update of the same cohort 
pretty much showed that the gap had widened just a bit during the pandemic. And so the bottom line is patients, these medically disenfranchised patients, felt like there was, it's, not, it's rigged against them. There's nothing that they can do. So they're not opting in. They're actually waiting, and which is driving the healthcare costs by showing up with more disease burden and also at the ER, which is definitely not sustainable for anyone. So it was with this in mind, with trust being the biggest barrier, that Genentech in 2021 built the CMG, or Commercial Medical and Government Affairs um, Health Equity Strategy, and the pillars are reflected here. At Genentech, we actually have a vision, a 10-year pharma vision, to deliver three to five times our benefit for patients at 50% less the cost of society. And when you think about our work, activating uh, patients to show up with early disease detection, making sure they're being screened for disease earlier, the studies show that that eliminates an entire line of, of therapy in advanced cancers. And so what a wonderful way to crush that goal in terms of 50% less cost to society. So we are really here from a place of authenticity and humility to really join this fight to close these gaps in care. But we have three pillars, and bedding representation is where research fits, and this is to ensure that we are including the patients that actually have the disease, and again, as I stated before, so that the data is representative of the patients that have the disease. The second pillar is around equitable care, and this is where affordability fits, because we know that that's one of the biggest barriers for patients, especially those of low socioeconomic status. But then the last one is where I'll spend a little bit of time talking about how Genentech changed the way we operate and we brought healthcare local to what we call ecosystems. So the people in this room, some of the mayor members in this room of the team, actually are bringing this um, fight local. And what that means is we're embedded in the community, we get healthcare from these health, health systems, and we want to be a part of solving for what's broken in healthcare. And so the sustainable model has made us or Genentech the ideal partner in this fight. But we're approaching this work on the local level around trust by listening and resisting the urge to solve for what we think a community needs and really co-create with the community some of the, the resources that they need to address the, the gaps in care. So we're here to talk tonight about social determinants. And Social determinants are actually, to your point, what drives the majority of patient outcomes. And so health-related social needs like affordability, education, social support, quality care, and where people live, work, and play are all drivers of health. These social determinants are 80% of what's driving um, bad outcomes for patients. And so we cannot afford to ignore and really create, co-create barriers, I mean, resources to remove these barriers for patients. So at Genentech, we've always looked at the patient journey from diagnosis to survivorship or outcomes. And what we have done is evolved our thinking in this space because we understand the importance of social determinants. So we have begun with screening and early disease detection and then get to diagnosis. But for the purposes of this presentation, we want to focus on how social determinants of health impacts treatment initiation because we know that it's a torturous road for underserved marginalized communities to that, that, to that actual initiation of therapy, as well as getting them to stay on therapy. We also surveyed oncologists and 91% of those surveyed agreed that the social drivers of health directly impacts treatment outcomes. So I wanted to dive a little bit into defining um, each of these categories. Um, when I think about cancer costs, they do impact um, patients differently. And so 83% of oncologists actually said that the lack of insurance or financial security is the most common affordability barrier for patients and nearly one in five do not fill their prescription due to costs. And so things like low income, a lack of savings, having to make those important trade-offs between filling your prescription and putting food on the table are definitely the supportability barrier is probably one of the biggest for patients. When you think about health literacy and um, level of education, 
a lot of resources need to be written in the third to fifth grade language because not everyone knows how to speak in these clinical language. And so when you think about the levels of education that help literacy, it really may affect the way your outcomes in this space. And so the fact that only 18% of breast cancer patients with a high school education receive um, early chemotherapy versus 33% of patients with a more education is really something that we need to address and make sure that we are putting resources in the market that are health literate and cultural linguistic for people. And lastly, when I think about you know, the higher rates of health literacy, um, it actually um, has been shown that patients are more apt to stay on therapy when they have a higher literacy level. So social support was also linked to treatment. Um, when you live alone, it, it, you know, when you're, when you're of a different marital status, um, mm -hmm. you know, these all affect your treatment outcomes as well. In fact, about 56% of patients reported that lack of support was, was really a cause for them not to seek treatment. And also 46% of the surveyed oncologists talked about that you know, these patients did not receive social um, services and this was a barrier to them filling their prescriptions and staying on therapy as well. And lastly, talk about healthcare. You know, when we think about this country and the demographics we serve, and I know Virginia is not um, you know, alone in this, there is a vast rural population. And so having to travel long distances, and when you look at this nationally, 20% of rural residents live more than 60 miles from a, from a health center. So it's more like a day trip for them. And it actually, if you couple that with low socioeconomic status, the trade-offs that have to be made are you can see what's gonna be prioritized and it's not health. And we know that you know, uninsured and underinsured leads to higher rates of, of, of non-adherence as well. And so these higher rates of discontinuation for even Medicaid patients or patients that are self-paid versus those that are on private insurance also um, serves as a barrier as well for patients. So when we think about living environment, and you know, actually the importance of exercise in this space, right? If you live in a neighborhood where there are no sidewalks or nowhere to walk safely, that is also a potential barrier. And we know that 23% of patients actually have reported food insecurity as a barrier to care. So these are all of the social determinants of health that actually have been leading to poor outcomes, quite frankly, and represent a majority of the problem that we have to address to really um, remove these systemic barriers for patients. And so at Genentech, we actually have a lot of support services. We have access solutions where we have a copay card so that that barrier is removed for our insured patients. We have um, a free drug program, so if your plan renders you uninsured or underinsured and you meet certain financial criteria, you can get the drug for free. That's our commitment to patients. We also have patient education because we play in a lot of disease areas. We play in seven disease areas with oncology being the largest one, and we have more than 80 medicines in development. And we have an obligation as a company to be part of solving for what's broken in healthcare. And so our educational resources, we have made sure that they're culturally sensitive and, and help literate to make sure that they're truly activating communities that they can see themselves in the ad and answer the call to action to seek care. So with that, at Genentech, my last slide, we really envision a world where every person can actually experience their full potential at health. We actually take this charge very seriously as a drug manufacturer. We have a lot of educational resources that we, we actually have embedded in the community to really be part of solving for healthcare disparities. And so with that, I will turn it over. Thank you, Judy, for giving us a great look into what exactly is social drivers of health. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was quoted as saying, of all the forms of inequity, of all the forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare 
health care is the most shocking and inhumane. So my question is, what does that really mean? That, what does that mean? That means you don't have what you need over here to live those extra 30 years. Unfortunately, there's a lot of research that shows that someone's zip code can be more important than their genetic code. Zip codes matter, child. If you do not live in the right zip code, you don't have access to a lot of things that you need for survival, and that's just a fact here. Well, we've got food desert here in this community. We also have health care desert. And that shouldn't be the case. Whether you live in the Gold Coast or the South Side, you should be able to get the same access to care. How do you predict that a child born today, based on their zip code, their quality and their longevity? That's terrible. That's terrible. You mean where I'm born, where I live, determine my quality of health? Yes, 90, 60. In Brazil, I think it's something like 72. Uh, the average child was like 85. But those are huge gaps. Bronzeville is not a monolithic community in some respects. The people here are pretty diverse, and so it's a very lively community, but also has some major endemic problems that have not really been addressed. If there are already a fragile society to begin with, anything in addition is going to be telescoped and magnified, right? And so I think the same applies to things like cancer. You know, cancer just happens to be the most devastating diagnosis we can ever get. For most cancers, almost all cancers, African Americans have higher rates of mortality compared to other groups. These discrepancies in cancer rates among African Americans or people in these neighborhoods is because they have gotten diagnosed late stage. Well, if they were aware earlier on and had access to good medicine, you reduce those numbers. So for us, that's really critical. And what you guys are doing in the American Cancer Society is important to talk about it, to talk about it in the culture that you're in. I see it. So, Arnithia, would you highlight what is being done about social drivers of health at the institutional level and help provide some historical context? Yeah, sure. So I really appreciate that video because, um, you know, that I believe they were talking mostly about Chicago, but like we're in Richmond and we have the same thing here in Richmond. Um, there were some studies that came out a few years ago that looked at life expectancy of individuals who live here. And so maybe not like half a mile up the road from here. Um, there's an area called Gilpin Court and I believe the life expectancy was somewhere around 63 years old. And then if you go about I would say five to seven miles from there to this area called Westover Hills, it was 83. The interesting part is that Gilpin Court is closer to VCU Health, and so we're right here. And so when we start to think about, you know, who we're serving and if we're offering and if we're capturing the information needed in order to adequately serve individuals, like we can't, we can't dismiss those data, we can't dismiss some of the historical things we'll talk about. Um, and so here at VCU, and I would say honestly, I've noticed a shift in many healthcare organizations across the country. You know, there was this recognition that social drivers of health do impact outcomes, but the question was, how do we adequately collect that information? And so VCU was a part of um, this. It, it was this program. It was accountable health communities, and it was like we were one of about 28 or so communities where we um, were collecting like social health, social drivers of health information from individuals, specifically those with Medicare and Medicaid, to see if collecting that information and trying to address those needs would impact outcomes and then what it would do with regard to costs. And I believe like the last data that I saw, um, and that was probably in 2022, but at that time they had collected data on over like 8,000 individuals and were, and were able to serve over 2,000 individuals. So they addressed, they were able to address certain needs. And some of those needs, you know, they work with, of course this is all coming with working with different communities and partners. 
So they were able to help individuals that were housing insecure, maybe help to find some housing. They were able to provide legal aid and assistance for individuals that may have had financial issues with regard to paying for their health care. Um, there was, I know, an effort with Feed More, which is a local organization here, to try to help to provide healthy food to individuals upon discharge. And so that's just one example um, of what our institution um, our institution has done, um, and then like I know d different centers within our institutions we do things, so we recognize even in the cancer center that individuals have needs beyond their diagnosis. And so having social workers more engaged with individuals throughout their journey on treatment and even beyond their treatment was really important to try to help individuals live like more holistic and better lives. Well, you just hold on to that because okay. I'm going to pitch this question okay. to you. Um, Junie set it up. Okay. Um, could you talk to us about the importance of building trust and trustworthiness as it relates to social drivers? Mm -hmm. So I was just having a conversation. I'm not going to say the person's name. They're here. Um, <laughs> one of the individuals in the audience, right before this, we were talking about um, both of us have been um, a part of this institution for some years. Um, and you know, we have our past wrong, wrongdoings and everything in this community, and people are still alive that remember them. They have not forgotten. They pass on. They pass on the stories, and some things still happen today with people with care. And you know, I feel that it, it is very difficult for institutions to build trust and trustworthiness without um, true engagement that people can really understand. Because if so frequently, you know, especially at an academic medical center, we have the care that we provide, but we also have research. And many of the times, outside of people coming to see physicians, they're, they're talking to researchers and individuals like myself that are out in our communities, and we're like, hey, we're here to do these studies, and we get our data, and we're like, so long to you. And so that is a barrier to institutional trustworthiness. So it really takes all entities within the institution, researchers, and um, clinicians and physicians and everyone that wears the cape of your institution because no matter where you are like no matter where I go I'm, I'm VCU it takes you to be very mindful of that in all of your engagement um, it takes you to recognize that the community is not just them and us um, it takes that to recognize that there are strength and riches and riches and wealth in these communities that we serve and that we are here to really build true partnership and it, it takes a lot of work. Sometimes more than mo the money, the, you know, the money will dry up. Um, sometimes it's not even the interest per se at some levels. But I think that's kind of how you start to build that. It's like this really vested interest in these communities beyond just the data and, okay, we provide this care and that's it. Yeah. Okay. So with that trust and trustworthiness, okay. <laughs> so with that trust and trustworthiness that Arniki just spoke of, how do we platform from there as far as expanding diversity in these trials? So um, good question, and I'm probably going to be handing it back, but I wanted to add to the whole approach to trustworthiness. Um, as I shared, now that we're embedded in the communities that we're serving, just being present. When you think about trust, trust is slow to build and it's so easy to lose. Yes, it is. And so people need to know that you are there authentically. So, and, and I will say that representation matters. And so at Genentech, we have been intentional about making sure that our sales force, the boots on the ground, if you will, in communities are reflective of the community that we serve. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we know that there are certain entities that have the trust of the communities. These are our faith-based leaders. These are the barbershops and the beauty shops, believe it or not, okay? Like my sister's a stylist, so I could tell you that she is, you know, counselor to all. <laughs> um, greatest network, by the way, <laughs> in that beauty shop or that barbershop. <laughs> I can also say that there are community-based organizations doing the work that have the trust and know how to bring the people out so that we can educate and activate them. That has been a winning approach to attach ourselves and build that bridge. I'll give you a quick example. There's a nonpartisan group called National Minority Quality Forum, and they are dedicated to closing gaps in these underserved, marginalized communities. Um, Flint, we all have heard of the water crisis nine years ago. 
the end result of that, the data is clear that across all cancers, there's been an increase in 48505, that zip code of Flint, while the rest of the state is actually decreasing across the board. What that community, that they lack trust of their city government. They lack trust of health care, but they let NMQF in. And NMQF allowed us to t attach ourselves to them. Two Saturdays ago, Genentech was invited to a community event to actually speak to the community. That would have not happened had we not done the work. Again, attaching yourself to someone who's considered trustworthy and credible, and then building that own bridge. And it took some time, but it also earned a Genentech a seat at the table, a trip to the White House to address what's going on in Flint in terms of the cancer crisis with the Biden administration, cancer moonshots 2.0. And so that's one example that this is a winning approach to attach yourself to advocacy groups, these community-based coalitions that is the way that has been the winning formula for us, but it takes time and you have to be present and rolling up the sleeves and being out there in the heat, y'all, um, <laughs> with the community. That's what is required, and that's our commitment to this work. Now, what was your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> research. Yeah, but what, it's, before you get into the yeah. research, what I'm hearing you say clearly that the right partnerships are essential. Yes, okay. absolutely, absolutely. As you, as you saw referenced on, on the Bronzeville video, American Cancer Society, we've been partnered with them. We have a new partnership with the American Diabetes <coughs> Association, because again, we care about the vision loss that is played. One in five um, people of color are walking around with diabetes and don't even know it, and they're not getting their annual eye exams. So building awareness, actually pushing the importance of wellness, or how we're leveraging these partners to create that generational shift that's required in this space. Because this is a long game, y'all. My commitment <coughs> is to go as far as I can go and then hand it to the next generation to take it the best of the way. Because again, these health behaviors have been embedded to not go to the doctor unless you absolutely have to. These are the norms that we have to unlearn in this space and get folks to lean into early the disease detection and screening. Well. From here for the girls, we are grateful to be in partnership with both you, Genentech, and BCU. And um, Arnitha, could you go back to the um, consider the social drivers of health while expanding diversity in the trials? So I'm actually going to take a page out of Junie's book. So part of, I think, what makes it possible for us to address social drivers with regard to trials is are our partnerships and who we partner with. because. As you saw with her presentation, you know, we're talking about transportation, housing, social support. I mean, one entity cannot handle all of that. And, um, and so it's really like galvanizing all of your community partners, some of which who have been doing this longer than many of our institutions, and working with them to try to address individuals' barriers to trials. Aside from even the social drivers as a barrier, you know, it's actually training our staff and our physicians to even ask the question in the first place. So many, you know, so often we say, oh, you know, we talk about social drivers as one of the barriers to trials, and yes, it is. But sometimes that, the biggest barriers are at home. It's, you know, are people even asking individuals if they want to be in trials? Are they assuming because this individual has, like, public or government insurance that they probably can't, yeah, they probably, and these are all things I've heard um, in, like, interviews and focus groups with different patients of, like, why they feel like they weren't asked to be in a study or a trial that they feel as though people look at them because of certain things and just don't invite them. So we have that barrier to cross first, so how we train individuals, implicit bias, et cetera. But then it's, you know, once we do invite individuals to trials, it's important to assess where they are with regard to their social drivers, and I'll take it further, needs. So it's like we know that those drivers, but what do they actually need? And if, if we can Part of being able to do that, like all this whole conversation is full circle, because part of being able to do that has to do with trust. Because even if you sit in front of me and you ask me questions on the questionnaire about social drivers, I might not trust you enough to even give you that information. Um, because I'm, I feel like you're gonna judge me, they're gonna be like, oh, you know, that's the problem patient over there. And so it goes right back to how we build trust in our communities and trust with our patients. Then being able to ask these questions and then galvanizing all of our resources and our partnerships to be able to address these needs. 
And I think, it, I think if we can hit, so it's definitely a multi-level, a multi-pronged approach. I feel like if we can hit all of those, then we definitely can achieve you know, more diversity in trials. Okay. You both spoke on this, um, but I would like to know if you can expand a little bit further on ways that the healthcare industry um, is removing some of these social drivers of health, some things that you know that some of the um, healthcare agencies are taking some steps to move some of these drivers. Yeah, so I've, I've heard a couple of things recently. Um, so I know that the you know lack of tra transportation or transportation as a barrier is one that has been addressed. And working now with rideshare companies um, and other you know transportation companies within the area to be able to provide transportation to individuals. I've actually seen that one, so that's pretty neat. Um, I did hear recently from uh, a person out in one of the communities I um, that I go to church in that she was getting care somewhere and they provided ride share and so when she she was very excited about that because if not she would have to take the bus and walk blocks and she had just had surgery so it was a big deal but then she said oh when when I went on the thing I found out that it's a reimbursement so I have to pay first and then they'll pay me back mm -hmm. and I was like oh. so it's like we're kind of getting there in some instances but not fully getting there because some people don't have the money to give up front so that they're, you know, so that they're reimbursed. And so um, that is an example. So I have seen it done well and then where we have improvements, I've seen that. Like I mentioned previously, I've seen where we partner with um, organizations to help those who are food insecure. Um, and, and that's one, or like, and so specifically upon discharge. But then, you know, so we're doing that check and that is excellent. What happens after discharge and later? So it's, you know, I, we are, and it takes, like Junie said, this is, this is gonna take some time. So I'm like, we're not gonna be able to solve everything overnight, but I definitely see us going in the right direction of recognizing how we can start to provide for individuals. Um, but we have a long way to go. Um, so one of the, um, the National Cancer Cooperative Network is really looking to um, incorporate this in, in the guidelines for all of our cancer centers. They do recognize that these social barriers are the biggest hindrances to outcomes or even just treatment and staying on treatment. Um, and so um, next week I'll be in DC to report on the one day working session that is the outcome of that work. And so we made 15 recommendations, some of them to CMS, um, as well as to in update the guidelines to really ask these questions at the point of care. And then similar to how it's like, how have you been since I last seen you? Asking a question like, if your social situation changed since our last visit, to make it more normal. It is recognition that it is, um, and, and this was really talked about um, at the one day working session, that the person being asked is uncomfortable because it's a personal question, right? And then the person asking the question. So training is required. That cultural sensitivity training is right. I'll tell a personal story here, you know, and I actually told it, in, you know, at NCCM. Um, years ago, my mother had no insurance. Um, she had a cancer diagnosis. I remember how I got her diagnosed. It was a friend of mine that was on call and said, bring her up here, I'll run a CBC. They discovered or diagnosed her with AOL. Um, again, I was working two jobs just to support you know, her medicines, and I had a, a health equity champion in Houston that was caring <laughs> for her, that it came full circle that I got to work with this woman. And I was able to tell her how much I appreciated her, instructing me how to write letters to charities to care for my mother. And as luck would have it, I joined a company that had an extended dependent benefit where I can carry her on my medical and dental insurance. I was able to get her seen at MD Anderson until she died, and she was only 55 years old when she died. I tell that story because in my mind's eye, I was so desperate as this young woman. I, you know, I had two children, divorced at the time, and I didn't know how I was going to care for my own mother. So I did not have any shame in saying I don't have. As a matter of fact, I can write a letter today because this woman took the time, this doctor took the time to sit me down and actually tell me what to say, how to say it in order to get the help that I needed to remove those. So, and I remember using that, that help to get my mother transported every day back and forth. And so, you know, we talked about the importance. It's if you are asking the question and you have a solution for the patient, then it's okay to ask. And it's okay to lead with that. Hey, if you are having trouble paying your rent, we have resources for you. 
And so I just think it's really important, but again, back to representation, it matters, because I'm more apt to tell that story to you than I am to someone that doesn't look like me, right? And so in this case, this, this particular physician was that, you know? She looked like me, I was able to just let go. And so we talked about all of this, but more to come on that, because it will be published. We're hoping that the guidelines for NCCM will be updated with the, 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 the health-related social needs questionnaire so that we can really normalize asking these questions at the point of care. Thank you. And I shared with the two of you um, recently that I recently took my father to an uh, audiology appointment, and during which the audi audiologist, she chastised my father for not getting the hearing aids since the last appointment. And so I had to advocate for him to explain to her that was because of his insurance and the high cost of the hearing aids. So, but I was there to advocate for him. So Arnithia, can you speak to how someone can advocate for themselves as it comes to social drivers? I got the hard question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <sighs> Let me think about that. You know, I think that, mm. I hate to go back to trust. I, you know, it's easier to advocate for yourself when there is that level of trust. So I guess the question is, if it's not the level of trust, how do you advocate for yourself? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, one of the things I tell people, um, if, if they're able to, if you're in a situation where you feel like you're getting, you know, poor care or, they're not, you know, you're not comfortable disclosing, and you and you can seek care elsewhere. I tell them it's like your hairstylist. If you don't like your, if I don't like my hairstylist, I'm out. Like if you do something wrong, I'm gone. And I'm like your health care should be the same. If you don't like the care that you're receiving, and you're able to go somewhere else, then feel like you should feel like you can go somewhere else. Because many people don't. They're like this is it. This is all I have. And it's like no, there are other there are other ways out there. So that's you know that's one way. I think that's a difficult question though, Teresa. Like. Truly, because it's really what you're, what we do when we ask when we ask that question is we put the onus on the patient, right. and and really we should be creating environments that are more conducive to which people feel like they can advocate themselves without shame and without someone you know oh I might not get good care, and so I, I might have to table that one until I feel like as a system and as entities we do a better job of making people feel comfortable enough to advocate for themselves. Even if it comes down to like, we don't even sometimes give people a chance to say, like to um, scrutinize a physician or, or say like evaluate their physician or their care. Like we barely do that well sometimes. So we certainly don't want to hear someone necessarily advocating for themselves. So I think we need to do a better job first before I answer that question. All right. So, yeah. Okay. Junie? Yeah. You want to leave that one? All right. All right. All right. Okay. All right, you hold on to that. First. Okay. All right. So how are we changing the ways we gather data and consider it and to consider social determinants of health in research? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so I like to say, so social determinants, social drivers of health, not a new phrase by no stretch of means. It might be new to a lot of people in this room. A lot of us act like it's new, just like disparities and equity. It became the buzz phrase in the last like four or five years. Not new at all. I mean, the, the whole concept of it goes back. I mean, even like in the 80s. I think that's like when the Heckler Report came out in the 1980s, and even though the Heckler Report didn't specifically say social drivers, but they were talking about transportation or the barriers. So it goes back. Um, mm, what was your question? Because I was gone. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's How not about funny. gathering data? There we go, gathering data. Okay. So we, there have been numerous measures and instruments developed to capture social drivers. We're, we've done a good job. Because a lot of researchers, um, and even clinicians, I've heard people say, oh, I know their education level, I know their income, their insurance status, that's social drivers. No, it's not. Um, those are some factors that are associated with socioeconomic status, but not necessarily social drivers or social needs and risks, et cetera. So there have been more measures that have been developed. So there are a couple that I've used recently. NIH has something called the Phoenix Tool that is massive, but it's, it actually does a good job of assessing like social risk and social need and social drivers. Um, there's another called Prepare that I use, and that one is um, good for like social risk. So one is the development of measures to accurately, to try to co collect these data, and we have a way to go. The other part that I think Junie got to this is 
training staff to appropriately ask these questions. Because I, I know people now who are so like, oh, I want to do social drivers in my research. And I have talked to research coordinators who were like, yeah, all of a sudden they gave us this. We don't feel comfortable asking this. We don't know how to ask. People are asking us why we're even asking these questions. So it really comes down to making sure your, is it a research team or your, your team, your physicians, clinicians, et cetera, are, understand what they're asking. Um, learn how to ask the question to people because it is personal information. And so I think a recognition of that and a practice of that will get us to where we can really start to collect these data in meaningful ways. Because the other thing is that if we're not really asking the questions correctly, they're not accurate data. Um, and so in one of the studies I have, we collect these data over time. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you can see these trends that are going in weird ways and you're like, oh, maybe they were not comfortable you the first time you asked that question. Um, and so we, um, so development of better measures than we have now, um, training the staff or individuals to make sure they can ask those questions. And then, you know, honestly then, back to us, researchers, clinicians, et cetera, is how we use, how we use that data. So anytime you're, I always say, anytime you're doing work with individuals and this equity, disparity, social drivers, you have to be really careful with how you disseminate those data. Because you can end up harming communities more than you're, hurt, you're helping them. And so you're like, oh, this community needs all of this, and they need this, and they need this. And it's like you're making it seem like that community is like there's a detriment or the deficit in that community when there's so much more there. So, you know, I tell some of my partners that I work with or other uh, researchers that are like interested in this space, be very careful um, with these data because you really can do more harm than good. Yeah, the only thing I'll add, <coughs> the only thing I'll add the feedback we've gotten is, to your point, they are so, communities are over, like, this inquiry mm -hmm. without reaching back or inquiring without a solution, yep. mm -hmm. you know? And so yep. we have to guard in the name of trust, you know, against going in with our old, with, with self-serving, let's gather this data so we can write a paper. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's the only thing I will have. Just, it's a, it's a huge watch out, because they're, they're just over it. Yeah, yeah. I agree. So next question, what are some things that will develop and take place based on this new research about social drivers and health? Uh, so, you know, in my research, because for us at Genentech, um, we remove the social barriers to health through our charitable giving, right? So there has been, you know, you talked about the ride share, you know, so we've given grants to, um, we call them chemo rides, right, to remove that transportation barrier to different institutions. Um, in the past, you know, from um, a, a mobile unit perspective, we have sponsored the deployment of these mobile units into communities to remove that transportation barriers um, for, for patients and in underserved communities as well, because that's like bringing the care um, to the community. And so, you know, what was the question again? I guess it's even oh, time. <laughs> <laughs> Things that are being developed um, and taking place based yeah, on the okay. research. So I know where I was going with that. Yeah. Y'all are human. Um, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I've seen is there has been an uptick of companies who are actually automating these resources across to empower the patient. So if we can really collectively agree to push these um, websites out there where patients could be empowered themselves and remove the stigma. I think that is a path forward. One of these, and I know you're going to probably close with this, is that findhelp.org. If you put your zip code in, it's so easy to use, findhelp.org, um, that you can it'll bring up all of these services that will, even if you can't pay your rent. You know, I had put in, I was in Flint, and over 2,000 programs came up. And I was with um, a senator, and he was delighted that the rideshare program was listed on this site. So it was quite impressive. And every zip code that I've put in, um, I have, I, there's a ton of services out there. So when I think about empowering folks with some of these companies, you know, that are actually building these technological tools to remove that discomfort, those are the things that I think we can do. Um, right now is to get the word out there um, so that folks can empower themselves and remove their own barriers. Did you add to that? Yeah. So I think, so some of the things we've done, one of the things we talked about earlier was 
um, rural, you talked about rural areas. And so here at Massey, you know, part of our catchment area, we do have rural individuals and rural residents. And so um, we, there are a couple of things that we, we try to do to try to eliminate the barrier. And so recently Massey rolled out their mobile health units. And so they have these vans that we roll out that, have, that provide education on site. I was at a site the other day and the van rolled up. You go inside and they have someone there that provide you with information about cancer prevention and smoking and et cetera. So those are really nice and they're all over. They're traveling all throughout our catchment. Um, we also have, um, there was an investment, which I, I think is so meaningful that the Cancer Center has sites outside of Richmond. And so we have a site in um, Brunswick County, um, which is like Southwest, uh, about an hour or so, hour and a half maybe from here. And they always say they have one stoplight, so that tells you Barnesville how small it is. But we have a site there of individuals who work in there for the cancer center. Many times these individuals are, in, are from the community, so they're residents of those communities, and they're there to provide health information and cancer prevention, and then to be that bridge between the cancer center here in the city and out there. And we also have the same thing down in Danville, Virginia, which is another um, area. I don't think quite rural, but still rural-esque. Um, and so these are ways that we're trying to limit the, the, even if individuals don't have transportation issues, we're trying to be where people are. Um, and so that they don't even have to worry about all oh, the cancer centers all the way over there. Um, with regard to research though, what we try to do is we collect these data and like Junie said, then it's like, what do we do with it? And so the whole thing, you know, in our cancer center now, we're pushing interventions. So it's like, okay, it's great. And you collect and you collect and then now what, what are you going to do with it? And so we try to, you know, we're collecting social drivers of health. What can we do at the next step with regard to the intervention to employ some of those identified barriers and try to like move health outcomes forward and then working with groups that are advocacy groups to help to push policy. So it's like this multi, again, multi-level, we collect the data, we try to create an intervention or something to address it and then hopefully it can help to inform some policies to help to address the barrier that we started with. All right, now at this stage, it's your turn to ask questions <coughs> or any questions from Facebook. Any questions? I have a question. Um, earlier you talked about we need more boots, no boots on the road. We need to get the word out more. Are there any measures being done to help promote and get you more advocates in the community to help spread the word to let the people know exactly what your organization is offering, what other organizations are offering? Yeah, great question. We're, oh. Thank you. Um, so we do a lot of conferences, symposiums, um, health events, like health fair events, where we are displaying and actually having materials to really educate the public on their risk for disease. It could be from stroke to cancer, you know. Um, and so but what we have done is there are several community-based organizations, um, African American Male Wellness Agency, um, is one that I will bring up. We did sponsored seven walks last year and 15 this year. And they specialize in bringing out black men, y'all, which is a feat, okay? Yes. I just want to let y'all know. And, and when I tell you they come out and they come, go for a walk, Houston had 4,000 wow. black men to show wow. up. And out of that, 300 were screened. And some of these men were in trouble, y'all. A couple of them left to go to the ER because their blood pressure was so elevated. And so really attaching ourselves to these, these actual community-based organizations that specialize in bringing people out so that we can educate and activate them to do something has been a very much a winning approach. And so that's one example of how we've been showing up locally in this work across cities. A lot of our institutions like VCU, they put on different events. That's all about trust building, educating, and activating. And that's how we show up in the work again and you know, because this work, it, not one entity or one member of the health ecosystem has all the capabilities for solving. And so this is really truly a group effort where we have to do this work through, through partnerships. And that's been the winning approach that we have done in these communities to make sure that we're bringing folks out and in a fun, fun way, yeah. you know what I mean? Because there's always food involved in music too, <laughs> so. First, I wanna say thank you so much So I was wondering if we could talk for a moment in regards to patients and work-related responsibilities in childcare. 
one of the things that I've seen quite a bit is individuals having or needing to bring children in when they have chemo treatments or especially with follow-up oncology visits and therefore they don't do the follow-up oncology visits because children are not allowed in some of the oncology centers. So, and then what do you do with the children if you know if you have to provide information to patients so that's my first part of the question the second part is the work related responsibility if you have someone that's trying to um, i worked with someone one time that was you know they were working three jobs so the, the ability to be able to get to chemo and and for follow-up screening made that very very difficult um so i was wondering if we could talk about that for a moment oh melissa um, so I'm going to try to put on my social worker hat for a minute because I feel like those are the individuals. So I, I have not honestly heard of programs, and, and I know there are people here from Massey, so someone can definitely speak up, but I have not heard of programs here um, that, that address child care, have not. Um, and so that, that's on my radar now, never heard that. I've heard people talk about that as a barrier, but I haven't heard that. Um, and then the other one you were saying, work-related. Um, I do not know that either, Melissa. And so like, I think this is one of those instances where, you know, because I know who you are, I'm gonna have to ask around and get some answers back to you. Because I have not, within the context of care, I have not heard anything about that. What I will say, though, is that one of the, one of the ways that I know Massey has tried to address some of these barriers, particularly particularly for women like as they're, oh, I talk breast cancer, so I talk, as you're going through treatment and you're transitioning out of treatment, is their development of their survivorship care clinic. No, I love that clinic. Yeah, and so that, the survivorship care clinic, so it, for those who don't know, we have, we, we start, we have this physician, Dr. Susan Hong, who that's what she, she, she does survivorship. And so we recognize that individuals who go through their cancer care, and then it's like, where do I go next? Do I go to my oncologist? Do I go to primary care? Where do I go? How do I make this work out? I have to go to this doctor for my cancer, maybe this doctor for my high blood pressure. And so Massey has developed this comprehensive survivorship care clinic wherein people can come to one physician to get all of their needs taken care of. Now, I think that's phenomenal. I've heard nothing but good things when I've been at random cookouts and stuff and people talk about, you know Dr. Susan Holmes? So I've heard great things about it. But I think that approach is also a way to try to limit the, 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 the burden on individuals as they're trying to especially navigate through long-term survivorship and who should they see and I don't have time to go to this many appointments and do all this, now is I get to go to one person and that one person can handle all of my needs. So that is, that is a, an answer, but I, I, would, I would definitely try to dive more into some of the specifics that you addressed. I love yeah. that answer because I agree with you, that clinic, well, she's amazing, and that clinic, yeah. I feel like has really, um, has really filled a void that was there. Yep. We talk about a lot in our organization of what, there's this place, this you know, this place of I finished with treatment, but you know, I've got all of these other pieces, I've got all these other yeah, mm -hmm. follow up visits. So, yeah, but I mean, you bring up a good point because the treatment part that's when things are quite burdensome, like how often you have to come and everything. So, yeah, I definitely need to learn more about that because I'm yeah. not sure. My one word is defineheld.org. They actually have they actually have child care as one of the awesome. barriers. Yes, and then you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a trade off. You know what I mean? And then you know it's interesting because that Bronzeville video, if you play it all the way through, he talks about that working mother who will lose their job. And so what they try to do at that at his institution is line that patient up for everything they have to do in one day, so they don't have to come back and risk losing a the job. These are the hourly workers. So I, again, pretty robust website, but I'm pretty sure it had child care on there as a resource to Thank remove you very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned about the um, mobile units at Danville and Lawrenceville. Are they, do they go around? Do they go to different areas? And is this owned by VCU or do you partner with Lions of Course, HCA? And okay, so the mobile units and the two, the Bron Brunswick and Danville are two different things. The, there, we have cancer research and resource centers. They're actually built brick and mortar buildings in Lawrenceville and in Danville. And they're staffed, and if we have trials going on here, they can, prom they can promote them there, so they are there. Okay. Then we have the mobile health units. They go all around our entire catchment. 
So you might catch them. I know they, they stay out of Petersburg, so you never know where they're going to be, but we have two of them now, and that's literally what they're trying to do, just expand our reach throughout our catchment, provide more like services, education, et cetera. And do they have volunteers that work on the mobile unit, or do they, they work So they actually, from, here? from what, they're clinicians and staff from our community outreach and engagement team okay. um, that work those. I don't know about volunteers. Okay. I'm sure we would love some. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to turn down volunteers. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question, and this is probably more for you, Dr. Sutton. Um, when you think about getting data, and we think about technology, and really getting to understand the communities that we serve and that we live in better, you mentioned there were risks potentially that could adversely impact certain communities by the way you collect or distribute that data. Can you speak to like an example of how, like what that looks like? So I, um, I learned this from my mentor. So Dr. Vanessa Shepard, as a researcher here at VCU, she trained me on disparities and equity and pretty much everything. And one of this, one, we were doing this study and it was focused on religiosity. And we're looking at religiosity as reported by black and white breast cancer survivors. And I believe that the way the result, it was like we found that there was an association between religiosity and let's say adherence. So black women reported higher religiosity and they also reported lower adherence and it was like, uh oh. So are we gonna say black women that have more religion are less adherent, like more church? Less? So it was one of those things where it's like, you have to be careful of what, like how you, how you report findings. Because, um, and so what she taught me was like, we had to go back and look at the measure go back and look at the group, you know, talk about the sample size. And this is not really a good sample size to even make this kind of conclusion, which people do that craziness all the time. And so that's, the, that's just an example of how the way I, we could have reported it could have been very detrimental, because they're going to be like, oh, yeah, black people are very spiritual and everything, and that's why they're not. And it's like, no, 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 that's not what we meant. But that's one example of how you have to be careful. And so then you can imagine if we're collecting data in a concentrated area, and, and many people are like, oh, you know, I'm food insecure, I'm food insecure. And then we're like, oh yeah, this area, they're very food, it's like, again, it's like that pointing the finger. And so whenever, you know, the way I was taught, whenever you're doing this kind of work, you have to think of the, the system level and why things are the way they are. So this area, these individuals here may be reporting that they're food insecure. It's not just because like, oh, you all need to go to a better area. It's because there are no grocery stores around, and there's no transportation to get to the grocery. So it's like understanding all of that when you report it versus just saying, this is the problem. And that's, that's kind of what I've seen from individuals who don't really have like training and really understand these kind of, these kind of data. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, thank you both so much. This has been so enlightening. Um, but I haven't heard you talk at all about uh, working with communities where English is the second language. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything um, to share about that? Yeah, I actually do. You can go first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one example that came to mind was um, Florida has a high Haitian Creole. It's actually behind Spanish, the number three spoken language. And so we had a breast cancer, we have a breast cancer educational campaign called What's Your Reason for a Mammogram? And so this particular champion, was a, it was an actual provider, came and said, hey, I would love to you know, get this translated into Haitian Creole. And so the team came to my team and said, the local team came to my team and said, hey, this is a need. And I said, well, we can't just straight translate it, right? We have to update it because these are black women. Black women suffer from dense breasts. Um, I know I live it every time I get my mammogram, the subsequent test, it's a, a, a time of high stress and we need to point that out. We also need to lower the age that, that was on the original campaign. So it was like really making sure that it was resonant for the actual population. But then we found out that Haitian Creole is a spoken language. Right. <laughs> and it's only in the last 30 years it was a written language. Oh. And so now we're working on an audio version of that campaign oh. because when you think about the target patient population, they are older. So this is a, a, a perfect example of listening to the community, mm -hmm. making sure that we are not trying to solve for what we think they need, but just it has to make sense, right? And so um, in terms of unique languages, my team has translated many of our resources into Hindi and Bengali and, you know, so it's not just the big three or four. 
Um, you know, it's really making sure that we're coming from a place where we're communicating. We have an obligation to communicate with people in their primary language. So it is a huge way of how we show up in these communities on a local level. Yeah, so here we, so I mentioned our community outreach and engagement team, and one of the, we have um, areas in Richmond, particularly the south side of Richmond, some areas in um, what is considered Central Hill Micro, where there are high um, population of Spanish speaking individuals. And so on our teams, we do have individuals who, um, who speak Spanish, who translate materials. Um, the health system at large has a larger team of individuals who speak a myriad of languages. Um, and so we, we try to, again, we have on, like our cancer center director, his, he has different cabinets and, and, and advisory groups, and he has one that's like a whole community-based direct, like director's group. Um, and so I think we take our, 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 um, our action from them. <coughs> so there was definitely a need initially, like, oh, you have to have individuals who are speaking Spanish. Like, wherever you go, you have to have it. Um, to my knowledge, I have not heard of any other languages that have popped up that has like an immediate need, but we know that we have groups around that we're gonna have to address. So yeah, we try to keep our finger on the pulse of that. Any additional questions? Anything in the Facebook? I'm sorry. It's a follow up back to the um, conversation you had as far as the data and making sure that when it's collected, it is um, being reported out correctly. Mm -hmm. But what do y'all do as far as making sure that you're getting the population to get the data from? I mean, it's that trust factor we talked about. So if we're not getting the information, what type of data are we putting out? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so. Ooh, many times. Um, the, so the, I can speak specifically to the work that I do and like what I try to help others. So I, mo all of my work is disparities and equity focused. Um, and so many of the studies that I have right now, I recruit black women and white women. The, I look at the proportion of black women that are treated in our cancer center or the numbers that they give us. I think they always say it's about 30% or so. So my goal is always to be over 30% for my studies. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I haven't had any problems with recruiting. And so people generally ask me why, and I'm like, because I know how to talk to people. Um, and so I, when I hired my, my staff, um, that was the one thing I told them. I was like, you know, we're going to have very in-depth conversations about how you talk to people. Um, and so um, that, that's kind of where I start. But, you know, Junie mentioned, like, your partnerships. Like, I have had partnerships with faith-based organizations for years here, and now the Cancer Center has given me an opportunity to be a leader of one of those, like of a group of faith-based orgs. So I really can like tap into them in meaningful ways to try to do recruitment. We were able to get, we had a trial that um, the, it's a, I think it's called the Pathfinder 2 study, so it's like one of those multi-cancer detection trials, and we decided, oh, they're like, oh, we, you know, we do need to do better with the diversity of recruitment, and so they came to Facts and Faith Fridays and what we do, and we had one of our leaders who is an executive minister at a church, he's like, you can come to my church. And they went out, like we worked with them, went out there one day and like knocked it out of the park. And so that really was because of our relationships and, not, and knowing that just like we tap them, they come back to us all the time, now we need this. And then I'm right there to do it. So, I mean, I would say definitely one, like knowing how to talk to people, two, you know, just having those, those community partnerships and like real partnerships um, that you know you could just pick up the phone and call somebody. It's hard to kind of train that sometimes. But. Well, I'll add, um, from our perspective, we take a data-driven approach. And so one recent example, back in 2020, we saw the biggest jump in mortality in liver cancer across black and Hispanics. And so um, we decided to do something about it. And we went out into the community and actually spoke to the CEOs of all the federally qualified institutions because we felt like they were closest to the underserved and marginalized patients, and boy, they gave us a ton of feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, even as a woman of color myself, we're about to, to, to actually put an image of a light-skinned Hispanic person, and they were like, this is Texas, you need to darken that up. Um, three shades, she said, quote unquote. And so really getting that feedback to really making sure that you're putting something out into the community, and then ready in the institutions. That's how we take a data-driven approach to this work because we actually have these heat maps all over the US and really map that back to some of the therapeutic areas that we treat. 
and making sure that we are leveraging those to take that approach so that we can also make sure that we're making a meaningful difference and really actually partner with providers which represent that point of care to actually you know give us feedback because you know again the providers represent the point of care for the patients all we're out there doing is educating and activating communities to opt in is what I call them. But you know, that, that is how we're working from an industry perspective on, on, on building these resources with the community and for them as well. So I'm, I'm gonna add one more thing. Um, so the other thing I think that really works, like true community engagement at the start of your study or before you even start, and I was just talking to Teresa about this. So you know, I try, and many individuals at Massey, I know, and they do a good job at it, if we have community partners or individuals who um, identify in a group that we do not identify with, then we're working